So first of all, thank you. I, um, and I also would like to thank Michael because a year, almost a year ago, I went to Edinburgh for the very first time, and he organized this meetup. And I decided to come and visit him and some other friends we made at, uh, at a conference uh, about a year and a half ago. So Michael, thanks. And yeah, I really liked it so far this meetup. So let's talk about how you can use GraphQL without a backend. So basically, I'm going to show you how you can use GraphQL in your React application without having an actual GraphQL backend. So who's is actually for? So as a consultant, also as a freelancer, but also in teams, I've worked on a lot of projects where they had REST APIs. So Boon here is using REST APIs. So most of you are using them. So who's using GraphQL APIs? Uh, just a few. So in my, most of the teams I came in, I showed some videos of conference talks I did, of stuff I've built, and mostly that involved GraphQL. So when I went to those teams, pretty much, people started asking for GraphQL APIs, because REST API, APIs, they aren't, very, aren't necessarily wrong, but they have a lot of design flaws. And something that I'd like to discuss with you today and show how you can work around those design flaws and make your own React application uh, that uses GraphQL without actually using GraphQL. Because many times you want to ask for a GraphQL API, you want to change something on the backend as a frontender, you're going to walk into the product manager that doesn't have time for you, or maybe you're just going to say there isn't any budget to make the GraphQL API that you're asking for. So usually I don't really like uh, discussing with backenders how their API should be structured, and GraphQL is solving that problem a bit for you. So that's why I really like it, and why I'm going to show you how you can create one in your own project. So yeah, there are multiple ways to discuss this, so I'll discuss those ways, but mostly focus on how you can do it from a client-side perspective. <coughs> so a bit about myself, so as I might have already told, I'm Roy, uh, I'm from Amsterdam, and in Amsterdam I work on open source projects for the city of Amsterdam, which is the local municipality of the city I live in. And the things we're working on, they usually involve making applications that make the city better, uh, make the city more livable, but also make the jobs of civil servants. Um, like from office people to people that are walking around on the streets to make sure Amsterdam is safe. We make applications that make their job easier. So that's where I spend most of my time on. But also I speak at conferences and give workshops. Um, and I also have my own startup, which is SwitchBay, and it's a marketplace for uh, electronics, where you can basically sell uh, used iPhones or game consoles or any other stuff you'd like to get rid of that can be considered an electronics. So about my, this is about myself. Um, so let's discuss one way you could actually, uh, you actually have a REST API and you maybe want a GraphQL API. Because suppose you're working on a great project and the, the stack has already been chosen for you. Basically this project has been named the e-commerce platform of the future. So I don't know if you have an active LinkedIn profile. I've been probably, um, probably I've got like a dozens of messages from recruiters asking me to work on the next e-commerce platform of the future. Probably many of you have had emails like those or the next social media application of the future. And then you're going to start talking with them and they're probably going to show you the stack. Probably there might have been an architect already or maybe their CTO has made a plan for what this will look like. And as for the rig meetup, you're going to assume the forms react. Maybe recruiters are stupid and they ask you for an Angular project. It could be. So suppose we've got this stack for the e-commerce platform of the future. And it kind of looks like this. So there already is a design. Uh, there's a database, there's a REST API, and there's JavaScript and React. So this is probably a basic stack for a lot of applications that are being built this day that involve React. So maybe this is not really the e-commerce platform of the future because they're using REST APIs and databases and maybe not even serverless things. But I think there's other other discussions that we, we maybe can have at the after party later or the drinks after this. So let's have a look at the REST API and why I don't really like them. Or Mostly, let's have a look at their design and why they're designed like this. So REST APIs, as you probably all know, have multiple endpoints. And this can have some complications for applications, like uh, maybe like this. So we, if we look at an e-commerce application again, uh, UI is on the left. And you can see there's a REST API on the right. So this will be three endpoints that uh, needs to be fetched to fill this UI with data. So one endpoint is going for products, another one is going for the categories, and then another one is going to get your reviews in there. So these are three requests you need to make every time you want to fill this UI with data. And this is something, if you were involved in the actual process of constructing the API, you probably would have figured out this can lead to consequences for maybe lower network gears or maybe 
uh, those requests are very large. So probably at this point I hear you thinking, maybe we can reconstruct the API, or maybe we can look for other ways to create an API to fill this UI with my data. So maybe you're going to go up to your backend team and say, hey, we want a GraphQL API. You're going to start going to your product manager. I can work with this. I can't work with this tech because it doesn't really involve the things I like to use, and it's really hard to fill this UI. And probably in that situation, your product manager will say, we won't do that. We don't have any resources. Just continue with your job and make the UI as I wanted you to do. So at this point, you're already struggling with having to fetch all those endpoints to fill this UI. And you must continue as the brave front end developer you are because you're hired for a job, or maybe uh, you're really involved in this, you really need to construct this, uh, this application. So this is our current situation, right? So we're filling this UI with all those endpoints, and it all looks pretty, all lo looks well. Uh, but then you need to consider that REST APIs also return fixed data structures. So you will know that those endpoints will return the exact same data whenever you request them with all those fields in there. Um, that are the, there by design by your backend developers. So this is a REST API and all those endpoints are used in our application. And all those endpoints will have their own, um, will have their own data definition. It will probably look something like this. So it's a big JSON file, uh, it has all those fields in there, maybe nested relationships, maybe there are arrays in there. It can get pretty messy, pretty messy real soon. And maybe they don't even have a swagger for you installed, so it makes it even harder. And the only thing you're actually using from this endpoint is just a little bit of data. And you can imagine that this will go like this for all those endpoints that you're trying to fetch. So just to make this single UI, you need to fetch three endpoints, and also you need to fetch a lot of data that will be injected into your application. So every time you use a load set UI, and then leaving out that you might have not caching in, in place or not, maybe you have a lot of great caching in there and it wouldn't be a problem. Because this is something I usually also see at some projects. Um, they have APIs that are designed in a way that they are really heavy for an end user, and then they just solve it by putting multiple caching layers on top of it. So actually you're not really um, fixing the problem, just making it worse actually in terms of, uh, terms of usability for developers. But we'll get to that later. So this UI needs three endpoints, and three endpoints to fix data structures to actually fill it. And then something I already mentioned is developer experience, because developer experience for REST application isn't that great. So, like I told you before, if there isn't any swagger or declaration in there, so you can't really investigate the API, it's really hard to find out what data is in there. So often I find myself just going to Postman or going to the browser and see what my endpoint looks like, like what fields it returns, and it's really a big problem if there isn't a vast declaration of what those fields are. So often you find yourself just going to the browser and finding out what data is in an endpoint. So at this point, I actually got really frustrated and I started asking for that GraphQL API again because I really want to use it in my application because REST isn't that great for most mobile applications or like web applications you're building. And again, you probably have persistent product managers that don't like to help you with it and they're like, oh, we've got an API, it works, we've got an UI, you're building it and probably it can all work, right? It doesn't really matter to me that my uh, that my user needs to have three need to fetch three different endpoints and have really big data latency. Most people don't really uh, care about this because either they're using a very fast computer or they have a lot of caching mechanisms in place. So at this point, and this was an actual product I once built. So I started to wondering what can I do to fix this problem for me. Like one thing that isn't going to happen is my backend developers changing my APIs because. Those are already there. Maybe the backend developers already left the project. So you have to work with the, with the REST APIs that are already there. So in this scenario, three things I could do. I could just like wondering, quit my job, and find something else to do, right? Because you're a software developer. Probably there are a lot of jobs you can do, and there are a lot of things uh, to actually just walk away and start doing something else. Another thing you could do, and if you're a bit more adventurous and you've got a lot of social security, you can start writing in the company. Just start asking for the GraphQL API or you're going to quit. So maybe you're fired and again the next day, but it's, that's up to you. But you can write. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is just work around the problem. Just find your own solution to it. And maybe create that GraphQL API that isn't really an API. So just I was wondering, who would go for option A and just walk away and say, this is not a project for me. I'm going to do something else. So no one, so you're already adventurous and you want to go and make this project. Okay, that would work. 
So who would buy it? Who would start? <laughs> Only one people would buy it. So who would go for option C? So actually a lot of people have already quit the job, I guess, because I mostly <laughs> saw just half the ads. So. I guess if you don't say anything, I'm just gonna assume you're gonna walk around walk around it because you're sitting here in this talk and it talks about yeah, that's, that's my scenario. So just work around it and find your own way to create this GraphQL backend, or not really a backend, but this API, to fix a problem with REST. That is meme I created for, is actually just go around the problem and this, I believe this was somewhere, somewhere in Poland, like the home country of Michael, so maybe that's why I found out this, video, this photo. <laughs> this could be a bicycle lane, I think. In Amsterdam, it could be a lot of bicycles, so it could have been Amsterdam as well. Oh, let's see. So in this scenario, you would have multiple options, right? Because you can work around uh, this REST API maybe from server side, from client side, or maybe from a different side as well. Maybe there are other invention solutions to this problem. And we can't go into detail of all those options because there, there is a lot of options you actually have. So one of the things you might actually think about first is creating your own GraphQL server. And this is something that's easier than you think. Because recently at, uh, at the city of Amsterdam, which I was talking about, we're working on a lot of open source projects. And one of the things I'm working on, it's an open data platform where you can find all the data from the city, from um, existing, um, so we fetch those data from APIs, we deliver data sets, we have panorama videos in there, like those 360 things you see in Google, but then better and more accurate. Uh, we have all those, all those data objects in there and they're either APIs or they are uh, data sets, and they don't have um, a fixed structure. So every time we fetch one of those APIs, it will return different fields in different formats with different standards. So one of the things we actually did was building our own GraphQL server, uh, which we used to fetch those endpoints, get the data in there, normalize it to keep our UI stupid, because that's something we really like to do, keep your UI as stupid as possible, because you don't want uh, all that logic in your UI to normalize data, to catch data from different sources and tie it all together. That's something UIs weren't actually built for. And something I really see UIs getting being used for a lot more because with React you can do a lot of things. And one of the things you can do is make simple stuff ex extremely complex. And that's something I see a lot with React developers are really good at making really simple stuff like UIs really complex because you want to take away a lot of things the backend does, because usually it seems a bit more, more fixed and less flexible from something you want as front-end developer. So there's actually one package I really like. So if you're working with REST APIs that have, uh, are based on an open API schema, then there's actually a very great package by, uh, by IBM. I didn't know they were doing stuff like this. Something that IBM has built is this package that I recently started using when I um, like I told you, we've been converting REST endpoints to GraphQL APIs uh, because we liked it so much and because we want to normalize the data. And something then I figured out was IBM that created this package. So with this package, you can actually transform <coughs> open APIs uh, to GraphQL APIs. And you don't need to do any setup at all uh, because they've got a CLI, which you can use if you maybe want to test it. So I used the CLI just real quick to see what an open API with a Swagger uh, with a Swagger playground will look like if you transform it to a GraphQL API. And that's something you'd usually do with a CLI. And if you go a bit lower here, yeah, usually, actually what it does, it transforms your schema um, from Swagger, from your open API, to a GraphQL schema. So if you know how GraphQL works, it's based on schema. So every time you send a query to the server, which you can actually see on this part, so in here you're sending a query to a GraphQL server, and this is based on your schema. So as you can see, the schema will translate to a GraphQL schema, which is based on your open API schema. So this is actually very useful because I found out about this package and it really helped me uh, figuring out how REST APIs um, were structured and what kind of data was in there. And as you can see, it can work for uh, nested data links as well. And nested data is very interesting if you look at open API because uh, the way it's constructed over there is, it's a bit different from how you would constructed in JSON or maybe in GraphQL as well. Because you got links and you got, uh, it's just how hell JSON works. But as you can see, it automatically translates all these things for you. So I figured out if you 
really want to get started with building your own GraphQL server, first try figuring out if you've got an API, open API schema or if you've got something like Swagger in there. So you can actually start playing around with it. Is it actually useful to do it? Uh, do you like GraphQL? Do you like the syntax? Can you work with it? Can your team work with it? So I found out that this was really useful to get started with something like this. But then there was also another package that I really liked, uh, which is Apollo Link REST. And it's actually uh, something from Apollo. So if you use GraphQL in your project already, or you've been looking at GraphQL, then probably you've seen Apollo before. They're basically one of the bigger open source uh, open source companies that really uh, develop on the GraphQL ecosystem. And one of those things that's built is Apollo Link REST. And it's actually a QR code to a small demo application that you can uh, that you can find also on this URL. And in here, actually what I've done, I've used Apollo Link REST to fetch REST endpoints instead of GraphQL endpoints. So usually uh, you would need to have a fetch function to do this, or maybe use something like Axios to uh, optimize your fetch request you can do the same thing with Apollo, and then you can use the GraphQL query syntax instead of using uh, just an endpoint, uh, which would be a REST endpoint. So how this works? Uh, it's a bit like this. So at first, you need to create a regular Apollo client. So how Apollo client works, uh, the thing you're doing over here is creating our Apollo client, which would be a link to your REST endpoint. Basically, this is your base URL, because all those other URLs that will follow uh, will be tied to a data, to a data object. So maybe those will be your projects, maybe those will be your users or categories. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating an Apollo client. I'm also using a memory cache to cache things and to make sure that uh, whenever I reuse this query somewhere in my application, it won't be fetching it from my, uh, from my servers again. Because it can handle caching for you. And you pass it to Apollo provider. And Apollo provider is actually uh, based upon uh, providers as you would know them from the context API. So whichever components are nested in a component tree inside my Apollo provider, they are able to retrieve data uh, from my REST endpoints using Apollo. And if you would be using a regular GraphQL server, you would be using it in the same way as well. So actually something you can do, which I might be, I'm not sure if I added it to the demo, but something you can do actually is um, having a GraphQL server, uh, fetching, um, not really fetching, but sending queries to the GraphQL server, and then next to it also use uh, REST endpoints in that same Apollo client. Which actually helps you, because if you have a GraphQL server yourself, and maybe some projects you're using don't have a GraphQL server, you could actually use uh, REST endpoints in the same uh, application, which really makes it easier to, um, to handle your data inside the application. And then once you've set it as Apollo provider, um, those, uh, if the information from your client will go into the context and it will be wrapped as provider. So if you would go to a component that's inside this component tree, you can actually do something with that client. So you can send requests to your uh, REST endpoints and get the data back that you would like to display in your UI. So that looks something like this. So basically we're using our React Apollo component. And React Apollo recently also um, came up with their own hooks package. You can also use hooks. And here you can see I've got a query component, which basically is using the render props method to, uh, to get the data from my REST endpoint or regularly your GraphQL endpoint. And the same thing you can do with hooks. So this is a query component. Uh, instead, you also have to use query hook or when you're talking about mutations, there's a use mutation hook. Um, and this will work with uh, Apollo link REST as well. So what I'm doing here, I've constructed a query, which is the constant get product query, and I'm calling this, uh, I'm adding this query to my query component. So whenever this component renders, it tries to uh, send this query to my GraphQL server, or in this case, my REST endpoints, uh, to return the data to fill my UI. And as you can see, I've got different uh, props that came back from the query component, which are like loading, error, and data. And these are things that in, are in Apollo by default. So whenever you would send uh, the query for the very first time to your REST endpoint, uh, the loading prop will be true. So you can show a loading indicator, or maybe um, you can send any other message that you'd like to show to the user when your data is loading. 
and then you've got an error. So this will actually return an error that will return from your uh, REST endpoint. So maybe you're using a method not allowed, or maybe um, something goes wrong on your side. Then we show an error. And the data object is, this will be filled with the information from your REST endpoint, and it will be translated to the information that's inside my query. And how you define your query is actually the same way as you would define a query in GraphQL. So I've got the query defined part here. So basically this query uh, will get my product information. And as you can see, with one thing I will fill my entire UI. And this API is also fetched from the client. Which basically means that it works the same way as you would send all those uh, different endpoints to your, uh, REST, um, to your REST APIs. But now it's been done by Apollo. And it will send three requests, so one for your product information, for your category information, for reviews. Uh, but it doesn't feel like sending three requests, because as a developer you've got the experience of using GraphQL. And also you would be able to mix this in with an actual GraphQL query that you would send to an actual GraphQL server. So how does this work? So this works by, at first you define your query, uh, and I'm going to get my product information. So everything I'm putting in here will be called product. So basically, if you've got a JSON object that's being returned, then that entire JSON object will fall inside the product, um, inside the product type here, because product will be your first endpoint. So you would have your base URL slash product, and it translates the product over here. And which you can see uh, just besides product is called a directive. So this is a REST directive. Some packages you might be using with GraphQL, they have also have their own directives. And the directive basically um, helps you, because uh, this directive is used inside the AppSec syntax to GraphQL, this directive will help you um, doing something custom inside that syntax tree. So basically what we're doing here, we're telling to Apollo link, link REST that they would need uh, to link my product information to the type product. So you would have your schema defined um, on your front end that would actually say this is type product. And then you can say, what's my bot? So this bot will be product slash tree. Basically meaning um, base URL slash product slash tree. And that information will be, uh, will be in here. And then um, you're actually able to transform data. But now I'm gonna, just going to assume that your uh, JSON will be returned by this endpoint. It will have the fields in there that you can already see. So you have the field for title, you have a field for price, and you have a field for thumbnail. So these fields need to be in the JSON object returned by the endpoint for products. And if they aren't, there are ways to translate them, to uh, normalize the data for you. But then again, you should ask, why not just name it something else? Maybe name it price, excluding text, or whatever you would have in there. And then you do the same for category. So we'd also have a directive in here um, for the rest of the endpoint. And you would say what your endpoint is, which is product slash categories. And again, you can do the same for reviews. So this is a really convenient way to actually use, uh, have the feeling of using GraphQL, uh, to be actually use it, able to use the GraphQL ecosystem without having an actual GraphQL API. So that's something I can show you in this, uh, this small demo I created. So this would actually be the basic setup for it, right? Because we, we have a React component, um, which you actually start with. And then we would include Apollo client. And with Apollo client, we can make a connection with either a GraphQL server, or in this case, by using RESTLink, we can connect with a REST API. And I've created just a very basic REST API with, uh, with Mockable, which is something I really like. Because with this, you can just uh, set up a server real quick and just send mock data with it. So if you would go to this URL, We find nothing right here because we don't have any endpoints to find, but we have one for products. So this is actually my mock, my mock REST API. So I've created the REST API, and this REST API will have uh, fields in there, which I also used in my UI. So this is basically the title, the thumbnail, and the price. These are fields I will actually want to use in my UI uh, using Apollo. And also you can see this one has some links with uh, relationships. You can also define relationships uh, when you use something like OpenAPI. And in my application, I actually have a Apollo client and I've defined I want to use in memory caching. And also this is my base URL. So this provider that I created, it 
the clients get past to it. And then inside here is the product component. And the product component is actually where my UI would be and where my query components would be. And the UI is also something you can see on the right here. So basically I'm just rendering a title, a thumbnail, uh, a rating, uh, there's a categories I believe, and a price. And inside my products um, component, you can see I actually created, um, created the GraphQL query based on the information that's inside my REST endpoint. So what I've done here is uh, I'm getting my product, I've uh, defined the product, and I've defined an ID for the product. And this ID is something you can use when you define the path uh, that needs to be fetched from your REST endpoint because you want things to be dynamically, right? You don't want to be fixed to things you put in the path. You want it to be dynamically and being able to send arguments uh, to the GraphQL query. And then you can see I've got all these fields in there and I've also defined a relationship. So actually I've got a relationship with categories and reviews. And then how that would come back with my query component would be like this. So I send my query to it, I send my variables to it, and then it will give me the data which you can see here. So when I reload this, you can see a small loading indicator, and then the actual data. And the query component actually fetches the data from all those endpoints. So if I would go to the network request here, you can still see it's, uh, it's doing all those requests for you. Okay, so once I refresh this, you can see it actually it's going to make the request to my server and it's going to get all the data in there. So as you can see this is like my product information from Mockable, so you can see uh, whatever is in here, like the price, uh, the titles in here, there's also the title that's being displayed there. And then it would also fetch all the relationships you have. So as you can see there's our categories with fashion, as you can see here, and then the other object in this array will be uh, backpacks. And then you can see the same for reviews. So in the hood, actually nothing changes. You're still sending three requests to the server, but as a developer, you've got a very different experience. Because this time, you'll be able to uh, define what your data looks like yourself. You're no longer tied to using uh, REST endpoints with all the fixed data structures. And also, if you're trying to convince your product manager to go over to use GraphQL later on, you already have everything set up in your front-end application. So the migration path also looks way more optimistic than when you don't do something like this. And then you've got other ways to share data because you can export it and you've got relationships. There's a lot of things you can do with this package actually. But the uh, main thing to understand is that it doesn't really optimize the stuff uh, in terms of network latency or data just yet because you're still sending those fetch requests, you're still getting the data inside your application. The only thing what it really improves is your developer experience. And then there's always optimization to do. So with Apollo it gets really easy to cache information inside your application without having to set it up yourself, and without having, to be, um, without having to be reliant on whatever happens on your backend. So as a developer, this improves a lot of things for me. So yeah, this again, you can see the query right here. Um, oh yeah, like I told you, I didn't show it in code, but you can also uh, mix it together with actual GraphQL queries, and then just leave the directive out, and Apollo would help you figure out what should be uh, fetched from the REST endpoint and what shouldn't be. So basically at this point I hope I really convince you that you would want something to use like GraphQL in your application even when you're using REST. Because REST isn't, uh, by design, REST isn't really that easy to be using in the application or in UIs. Because if you, there's actually a very nice uh, documentary about um, how the guys at Facebook actually came up with uh, with GraphQL, because their main issue with REST APIs was uh, not really to fix endpoints, but mostly all the data that was returned from endpoints. So they have, um, and this was back in 2013, I believe, and in 2015, GraphQL became publicly available. But back in 2013, mobile networks were way slower than they are now, and mobile phones are way slower than they are now. So for them, they really had a problem with those big REST endpoints and all those big REST data fields getting inside applications. So that's how they actually came up with this. And nowadays it sometimes still amazes me how people can build UIs with REST endpoints um, and those responses from those REST endpoints are sometimes like over 200 kilobytes. 
and then people are complaining about keeping graph uh, React application as small as possible, so your bundle might be over 300 kilobytes, oh, that's a real problem. But as long as you're sending uh, requests to, to REST endpoints that return 300 kilobytes, it doesn't really matter if your bundle size is 300 kilobytes because the user still has to download it. But it's something to really keep in mind when, um, when talking with your backend developers about how to design APIs. So with this information, and I hope you, if you're not using GraphQL already, you've got some new inspiration and actually might want to go to your product manager or to your backend team to start asking for a more developer-friendly and also a user-friendly APIs like GraphQL. So your product manager might just say, yeah, just start creating that GraphQL server. And yeah, I believe we've got some time for questions after this as well. Uh, also, the IBM package which I showed you it's the first link, and with this, it's really nice to just try it out. And if you've got an open API somewhere, or you know a publicly available open a API, and there are tons of them, you can actually start playing around with it because it's a very nice introduction to uh, what GraphQL looks like opposed to a REST endpoint. And also on Apollo, you can find tons of information about uh, not only the package I showed you, but also about creating a GraphQL server or creating a GraphQL client. Uh, but there's also things you can find if you would search for my name on YouTube uh, or on Twitter. Thank you.